we're in our series, What Matters Most. And Jeff and I are going to be tag teaming this morning. Um, we are, uh, he's going to pop up here in a little bit. But we're um, in this series. If you haven't heard or, or watched or listened to the last two messages, go back and do that. Um, we talked about our first value of being all in. All the other weeks kind of uh, go off of that value of being all in. So that's foundational is that we're all in for Jesus. He's why we're doing all of this. He's why we live and move and we have our being. We have a king, and it's Jesus, and we have a kingdom, and it's what matters most. And so everything else we talk about is based off of that belief that, that Jesus is king. And so um, this morning, we're going to talk about our next value, which is that we are sent. Because we are all in, because we're all about the kingdom, then we're sent to the world around us. That value says the church is not a building but a movement. We are sent to love our neighbors and partner with God on his mission to redeem the world. Before we go into that, I've got a little bit of a confession, family confession, okay? We have a snack problem in our family. Anyone else have snack issues? Last Monday, thank you, parents, thank you. Parents are all over the place. I see that hand. That's great. Uh, We We, on Monday, bought an an enormous box of granola bars. I've never seen such a big box of granola bars. We're like, we're going to fix this snack problem. We're going to live in abundance, and we're going to buy this huge box of granola bars. By Wednesday, there was an empty box and no more granola bars. There are only three children living at my house right now. Like, where, where did all these granola bars go? I don't even know. I don't know if they're in their lockers. I don't know if they're storing them somewhere. I don't know if they just consumed all of that. But we have a snack problem. And we have one child that is actually the biggest culprit of all of our snack issues. And I'm not going to throw any of them under the bus. I'm not going to say names. But it is our oldest son. He is an adult now, and he still is the culprit of all of our snack problems when he is back in town. He's, he doesn't live here anymore, but when he comes back, I make sure to supply all the snacks. The biggest issues are vanilla wafers. Every time I buy a box of vanilla wafers, within seconds, it's empty. It's gone. Uh, and goldfish. That's the second one. So I'd buy these little packages of goldfish, have a package, and it's literally gone. It's like that's, he sees that as snack size, and he would take... I would find these up in his room, empty boxes of goldfish and vanilla wafer boxes in his room that he has just taken the snack out and taken it up to his room. So I was like, I'm going to make a solution to this. I'm going to buy the biggest box of goldfish that I've ever seen. And so I started buying these. It did not fix the problem, you guys. He's still eating all of the goldfish. And so he would take this out of the pantry, and he would take it upstairs, and he would take it into his room, and he'd just eat it. I'm like going, Max. Oh, shoot, I said his name. If you're watching, Max, um, yeah, yeah. You know what? I'm calling you out. He would take it up into his room, and he would eat all of it. And I'm going, Max, this is a sharing size. This is a sharing size. This is not an individual size of goldfish. This is a sharing size. And so I thought we had it fixed when uh, I, I, he was home for the summer for a couple weeks, and I saw that the goldfish box was in the pantry. And I was like, oh, he didn't take it to his room. He didn't eat it all. And I went to pick up the box, and it was empty in the pantry. Is there anything more maddening as an, a, a parent? Anything more? The cereal box, empty cereal box. Kids, don't do that to your parents. Why, why are you doing that? Just throw it away. There you go. Share. This is a sharing size. Thank you, Bridget. There might be some crumbs on you now. That just kind of spilled out. I think sometimes we do that as Christians, though. I think sometimes we take the goodness that we have and we hoard it, and we take it, and we eat it in our rooms where nobody can, nobody can share in it. We have a, the gospel is a sharing size. We have the gospel to share with everyone around us. And I think sometimes we forget that, and we take it, and we, we eat it for ourselves. If we've experienced the kingdom, we don't just hold it for ourselves. We're not just a bless me club, us four, no more, holy huddle. We have to share it with the world around us. We're going to pat, unpack some text today in 2 Kings 7. We're going to read the whole chapter. If you brought your Bibles, you can follow along. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles at the welcome desk. We'd love to give you a Bible if you don't have one. Um, if you're like 
uh, not sure about marking up your Bible, write in your Bible. Underline it. If things stick out to you, you can underline things. You can highlight it. If you want to memorize one of the scriptures, you can highlight that and memorize it. Write what, what you feel like God's speaking to you through it. But we're going to look in 2 Kings 7. And the context behind 2 Kings 7 is that there was starvation that was plaguing the city of Samaria. The, the people there were under siege by the Armean, Armean army. They were in dire circumstances. So they had no food. They were, you know, the, the, the army is, is outside the city. They're under siege. They're starving. Um, it, was, it was really bad circumstances. Uh, the famine was so severe that people re- were resorting to cannibalism. Everything was super expensive, like hyperinflation. And the prophet Elisha came to the king and prophesied that God would bring deliverance to the city. And this is what Elisha says in verse 1. Elisha replied, listen to the quarts of barley grain will cost only one piece of silver. He's like, gas prices are going to go down, all right? <laughs> the, the snacks that you were buying, they're going to go down, all right? He basically kind of referencing currently what was happening is a donkey's head, which people apparently were eating donkey's heads back then, sold for 80 pieces of silver. So 80 pieces of silver for, for a donkey's head that he's saying the next day, all this fine flour is going to be sold for one piece of silver. Uh, another thing that's mentioned in the chapter before is that a pint of dove's dung was sold for five pieces of silver. If you don't know what dove's dung is, it is poo. So they were eating that. So that was part of what they were using. Th- they were in dire circumstances. And that was five pieces of silver. And they're saying the choicest of flour and barley, that's going to only be one piece of silver. And this is uh, what the officer said in verse 2. The officer assisting the king said to the man of God, that couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. But Elisha replied, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. I want you to remember that because it's going to come back later. Verse 3. Now, there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance of the city gates. Why should we sit here waiting to die, they asked each other. We will starve if we wait here. But with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back there. So we might as well go out and surrender the the Aramean army. If they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. So they're basically going, what do we have to lose? Let's just just go in there and, and, like, take our chances. So at twilight, they set out for the camp of the Arameans. But when they came to the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping of horses and the sounds of great army approaching. The king of Israel has hired the Hittites and Egyptians to attack us, they cried to one another. So they panicked and ran into the night, abandoning their tents, horses, donkeys, and everything else as they fled for their lives. When the men with leprosy arrived at the edge of the camp, they went into one tent after another, eating and drinking wine, and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and hid it. Okay, so imagine this scene. I can imagine them coming in to the camp going, okay, in a few seconds we're going to die, like probably. The chances are, are against us, that we are going to probably die when we walk in here. And they walk in, and everybody's gone, but all their stuff is there. And they're looking around. I can imagine them, like, nervously laughing, like, running in and out of the tent and eating things and drinking things and, like, gathering stuff up going, I mean, they are starving. They're dying. People are eating each other. Like, it's, it's crazy out there. And they just found all the gold. They found all the food. They found all the things that would satisfy all their hunger. And they're going, are you kidding me? This is, this is insane. And so they're running, and they're, it's created some sort of a scarcity mentality in them, the way that they were living. So they're taking it, and they're hoarding it, and they're bringing it, and they're hiding it. And then, in verse 9, it said, finally, they said to each other, this is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. 
If we wait until morning, some calamity will certainly fall upon us. Come on, let's go back and tell the people at the palace. So they went back to the city and told the gatekeepers what had happened. We went out to the Aramean army, uh, camp, they said, and no one was there. The horses and donkeys were tethered and the tents were all in order, but there wasn't a single person around. Then the gatekeeper shouted the news to the people in the palace. The king got out of bed in the middle of the night and told his officers, I know what has happened. The Arameans know we are starving, so they have left their camp and have hidden in the fields. They are expecting us to leave the city, and they will take us alive and capture the city. And one of his officers replied, we'd better send out scouts to check into this. Let them take five of the remaining horses. If something happens to them, it will be no worse than if they stay here and die with the rest of us. Again, let's just take our chances. So two chariots with horses were prepared, and the king sent scouts to see what had happened to the Aramean army. They went all the way to the Jordan River, following a trail of clothing and equipment that the Arameans had thrown away in their mad rush to escape. The scouts returned and told the king about it. Then the people of Samaria rushed out and plundered the Aramean camp. So it was true that six quarts of choice flour were sold That day for one piece of silver and 12 quarts of barley grain were sold for one piece of silver, just as the Lord had promised. The king appointed his officer to control the traffic at the gate. It was the same officer from the beginning. But he was knocked down and trampled to death as the people rushed out. So everything happened exactly as the man of God had predicted when the king came to his house. The man of God had said to the king, by this time tomorrow in the markets of Samaria, six quarts of choice flour will cost one piece of silver. And 12 quarts of barley grain will cost one piece of silver. The king's officer had replied, that couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. And the man of God had said, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you won't be able to eat any of it. And so it was, for the people trampled him to death at the gate. All right, there's a lot we can pull out from that story, a lot of parallels that we can look at. I think one of the things that we look at is when we look at the the lepers when they went into the camp and they started taking all the things, they took all the snacks. It was like the goldfish, right? Bringing it to the room. Nobody else can eat it. This is the opposite of the value of being sent. We've enjoyed the kingdom of God and we are sent to bring that to other people. This is called a consumeristic Christianity. It's going, I'm just consuming, consuming, consuming. It's all for me. And I'm not it's not being, I'm not being a conduit of the grace and the hope in the kingdom of God. A consumeristic uh, mentality is a gorging and hoarding for yourself. Now, there's a balance there. Don't starve yourself. You need to have daily bread. You need to be getting inputs. But if you're going to be all in, if you're going, yes, I am all about the kingdom. I'm going to center my life around it. Then that means obedience-based discipleship. That means that my discipleship is Jesus. I'm going to do what he says to do. And when he says, go and make disciples, I'm going to go and make disciples. When he says, share your faith, when he says, preach the gospel, I'm going to go do that. Share the hope that you have. I'm going to walk in obedience to that. That is being all in. There's a quote that I don't know who said it because I've heard a lot of people said it, say it over the years, um, but I don't know who it originated with. And it's this quote. We are educated in the church way beyond our level of obedience. That kind of hurts, but that's kind of true, right? We are educated way beyond our level of obedience. Uh, We we know the things to do. We've heard the things to do. But if we just sit around and just talk about it, look at it in the Greek and Hebrew, (laughs) kind of go, what what would that look like? If we're just going, yeah, well, that was a good good message, and then go off on our way, we are educated beyond our level of obedience. When God says to do something, do it. Do it immediately. Walk in that obedience. We don't just consume. His word says that we're to go out and bring the hope to the world. But in order to do that, we got to love the world. Now, the word love in the Bible, loving the world, it's, uh, it, or the word world, means different things. So in one part of the Bible, it says, love not the world, right? Like, love not the world. But then another part of the wor- Bible says, but God so loved the world. And so when you look at that, you look at our English language, we've got words that mean different things. Like when I say the word ball, everybody's thinking of something different. Ball could be a round thing that you throw. 
Ball could be that um, we're throwing a, a ball, uh, like, a, like a fancy fancy dance that we get dressed up. Or we're having a ball, like we're having a good time, right? It means different things. World is the same thing. It means different things in different contexts. So one way that world means in the Bible when they're used is the universe. It means the earth, all that God's created, that he created the world, that, that it's a theater display God's power and his beauty. Another term for world in scripture is it's used to describe, and this is the love, not the world, a system of ideas, values, morals, practices, social norms that are integrated into mainstream, institutionalized in a culture that's corrupted, that's rebelling against God, that's redefining good and evil. That's the love, not the world, that part. But then a third way that the world is described is as humanity. And that's when God said, for God so loved the world. So as we are people who are in the world but not of it, we're to love the world. And we have to start with that compassion for people. That we can go, yeah, I do not like the way, world's way of doing things, but I can love humanity. I can love my neighbor. I can love that person who believes so differently from me. <laughs> That's how we can operate uh, giving the gospel to those around us. The lepers, when you think about that, the lepers were in a society that they were ostracized. They were on the outskirts of the city limits, right? It says that they were at the, the city gates. So they're on the outs. They're the ones that were like, stay away from us. It's a highly contagious disease. And so they were away from society. They were rejected. If you were a leopard, you were, people had nothing to do with you. And so if anybody could go, you know what? Forget them. They abandon us. Like, we're here. We're going to take this all for ourselves. Like, you know what? Serves them right. The way they've treated us. The way they've looked at us, the lepers had every reason to do that. Maybe you've had those, those feelings with people in your life, people that, that don't know Jesus, that aren't followers of Christ, that you're like, you know what? Serves them right. Like they, your consequences, right? Consequences to your actions, consequences to how you're living. You know, they're getting what they deserve. Here's the deal. We didn't get what we deserved. We deserved death but we got new life. And so everything that we can give to people is a result of that, of going, I deserved death. I didn't get what I deserved. Thank God. Thank God that God rescued me. Thank God that I do have a king. And I do, we, we are a part of this kingdom. And starting with, if I didn't deserve it, who am I to say that someone else doesn't deserve it? And so when you look at the lepers and they stopped and they were like, in verse 9, they were like, ooh, we feel conviction and we feel compassion right now. They said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news and we're keeping it to ourselves. The world is hangry, y'all. <laughs> the world, like, they need more than a snack, all right? They're hangry. You can hear their groans, their pain. It comes out in different ways. It comes out in anger. It comes out in whatever. It comes out all different ways. But they're hangry. They're starving. They're dying. They need what we have. They're searching. Those hunger pains, it's searching for identity, searching for meaning, for love, for acceptance. And we have the hope that they didn't know was even there. We're like those lepers in the camp eating and drinking, going, they don't even know it's here, and we are, we're getting to taste it. We're, going, we're getting to experience it. But keeping it for ourselves is not right. We need to share it. We're enjoying it. And can you imagine what they're thinking when they find out, wait, wait, I was starving, and you didn't tell me about this food? Like, you got the bread of life over here, and you didn't tell me? Like, I was starving. There's food for this hunger? You haven't told us about it. And we have all different reasons, and we have all different, you know, kind of obstacles to that. Sometimes we're thinking, oh, yeah, I don't want to offend, or I don't know if they're open to it. I have a friend that recently 
um, a while back, she had told me that, you know, there's someone at her work that she was kind of confessing, man, they just disgusted me. Like their lifestyle, just um, how they behaved. It was just, it just, it, it just disgusted me. And I just, um, I just don't even want to be around them. And then recently, she was like, so I started praying for that person. <laughs> and I love how, like, God changes your heart when you start praying. If you don't have compassion for someone, start praying for them because God will give you his heart for them. So she started praying for them, and she just said, man, I see them with such different eyes now. And she's been walking in kindness and compassion and grace and loving this person and seeing beyond what is the root of these behaviors. What are the things, like, what, what is that person actually searching for? And she's able to be um, a person that shows the love of God to her. But it starts with, this is not right. This mentality isn't right. This hoarding isn't right. It is not right what we're doing here. And, and it moves to compassion. Another thing we can look in this story is that they were still lepers. These guys were still lepers. So they went and shared the good news of the day. But it didn't change their circumstance. It didn't change, like, they were still lepers. And I think when we look at our responsibility to share the good news, I think we can look a lot about what we don't have and wh- how we're not equipped and who am I. Like, I, I mean, I'm broken still. I don't know how to do this. I'm not equipped. I, you know, I still have my junk Yeah, they were still lepers, but they weren't hungry anymore. (laughs) They were just lepers that were filled now. We're just sinners saved by grace. God chose them to be recipients and messengers of the good news of that day. That their starvation would end that day. We've experienced, if you've experienced the goodness of God, you've tasted, you've seen But you're going, who am I to be a messenger of the good news? The gospel is that Jesus is king, not that you are perfect. That's the gospel. Jesus is king, not that you are perfect. We don't, if we've we've tasted that, look at where the gospel has intersected and transformed your life, proclaim it, share it. Some of your situations may have not changed. They were still lepers. You may still have some issues going on in your life right now that haven't been redeemed yet, that haven't, haven't, maybe on this side of eternity, you won't see the promise fulfilled. But what the difference is, is you're not starving anymore. We have this hope. Another thing that we can look at is the Lord may call you into what was previously occupied by the enemy. He may call you into places, into territories, and into people that he wants to redeem. we got to listen, not with our own eyes, not with see it with our own physical eyes, because we miss it in the physical. We miss the goodness that God wants to pour out. we got to listen and go, God, where, where do you want to occupy? Is it my workplace? Is it this school district? Is it that relative? Is it this neighborhood? And sometimes when we look with our physical eyes, we go, eh, nope, not going there. Like that's, they're pretty, uh, there's some opposition there to the gospel. Like I don't think that that, and we resist it. And just like the lepers, that they wouldn't like expect this. They wouldn't expect this in a million years that God would do this work. That is a work. What God did and confused that army was something that only God can do. And can I tell you that God is doing something In this area, in this community, he is doing something in family members. He's toiling up the world. He's doing this this underground work that we don't see. And we look with our physical eyes, absolutely. We're like, yeah, it's a dumpster fire. Like, yeah, it's a mess. And we look at it with our, I don't want anything to do with that. And that's why we got to go, okay, God, what are you doing? Where can I join you? Where are you stirring up? Okay, I'll be obedient to be a part of that because we have no idea what God is doing underground. And he may call you into what was previously occupied by the enemy. One last thing that we can pull out from this story 
is guard against skepticism and cynicism. You know, in that story in verse 2, it says, the officer assisting the king said to the man of God, that couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. That couldn't happen even if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. I read that, and I got like, kind of like this, I was like, are you kidding me? That couldn't happen if the Lord opened the windows. Can you imagine if the Lord opened the windows of heaven? Like, we could, we would be overwhelmed. Like, we couldn't handle that. If the Lord, that couldn't happen if the Lord, do you know who God is? Do you know how big he is? Do you know how powerful he is? That couldn't happen if the Lord opened the windows of heaven. What kind of cynicism has crept in here? And I feel like Elisha felt the same way. He's like, oh, yeah? (laughs) <laughs> you're going to see it with your own eyes, but you're not going to experience it. That cynicism, that like, nah, God can't do it. God can do anything. He can do the impossible. But if we have hearts of cynicism, if we have hearts of like, nah, that person's too far gone. That place is like, like no, that's a, God can do it. And we need to have that childlike faith. Like when I, ha- when I was a kid, I thought my dad could do anything. I thought he was the strongest man in the world. Actually, I still think he's the strongest man on earth. He's in his 70s, and I still think he could beat anybody up. Like, he's so strong. But when I was a kid, I really thought like, like, like oh, yeah, my dad can, my dad's the strongest man. Ever. Like, we got to have that about our God of going, are you kidding? He can do anything. He can do the impossible. Our God can do it. He's so powerful. He's so mighty. He has no limitations. We see within the confines of our human limitations, God does not operate that way. So even if we don't see it with our own eyes, even if we see that it's impossible, it may be impossible with man, but with God, nothing is impossible. So we got to look with that kind of a faith and that kind of belief that God can do anything. Here's the great thing about that, though. If you're struggling with doubt or lack of faith, this is the graciousness of our God. It's not something that you have to stir up or like some sort of a psychological uh, positioning or assent. You can say, Lord, I believe, but help me with my unbelief, (laughs) right? You can ask for, give me the gift of faith, God. Help me see with your eyes. That is the graciousness of our God. And he will be faithful to do it. (laughs) Look, I don't know if you guys are ready to like, listen, this is, everything that we're saying this morning, like this is, this has been the beginning, this has been the plan since the beginning of time. This is, it's been the Lord's design for us. He is up to things in the world and his plan A, and there is no plan B, his plan A is to do those things that he's up to in the world through his people. It's to do those works through you and through me. From the very beginning, even when God was, was first promising that he was going to launch the rescue plan that he launched, and he was speaking to Abraham, and we quote this all the time and reference it all the time in Genesis chapter 12, the Lord spoke to Abraham and he said, right now you're living in a place where you know the people and you know the place, and I'm telling you, move from the place that you know to the place that you don't know. And then he said, I'm going to bless you and I'm going to make you a great nation, not so that that blessing will stay with you, but I'm going to bless you so that one day all nations will be blessed through you. The design of God is always that we would receive, but not just sit on what we're receiving, but that we would receive it and then become conduits of it going out to the rest of the world. That's, that's the way that he works. And so anybody who's going to be a follower of Jesus, anyone who's going to be like one of the people of God, his intention is that you and I are used for his purposes. Jesus echoed that sentiment. You know, we quote all the time, Matthew 28, 19, where we say that, you know, Jesus, his last instructions to his disciples was, it was go into all the nations and preach the gospel, um, baptizing people in the name of the Father uh, and the Son and the Holy Spirit, um, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. He, he says all these things. Go and make disciples. Do this over and over again. It's in the scriptures. Well, in John chapter 20, um, he 
references this, what Jesus, the last instruction that Jesus gives, and he puts it a little bit differently. In John 20, it says, this is after Jesus had been crucified and he had been raised to new life, and, and, um, and so he kept appearing to them at different times to the disciples, and he would give them different messages. And one of those times, it says this, that on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed, them the, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Listen to verse 21. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. This is why we have a sent value. Jesus is literally echoing what God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you so that you will bring blessing to the rest of the nations. And then Jesus is saying, I'm doing something amazing in you. And as the Father has sent me to do something amazing in your life, I'm actually sending you to go do amazing things in other people's lives. And then he breathes on them and he gives them the Holy Spirit. Like this is, we are all called to walk in this way. If you are a follower of Jesus, this isn't like an a la carte thing. It's not like, well, like the super Christians go make disciples and the super Christians go and they become missionaries and the super Christians, they're sent. It's like, you, this isn't the lunch line at your elementary school where you're like, nah, I don't really like broccoli and I'm not gonna take that, but I do like this part about, it's like, now if you follow Jesus, if you are a disciple of Jesus, you will be a maker of disciples. That's what it means to follow Jesus. If you have received the goodness of God, then it means that we will bring the goodness of God to the rest of the world around us. We, we don't have an, I mean, we have an option. We can obey or we can disobey, but we don't, like, this is the plan that's laid out. There is no plan B. And so when we talk about the church, how we're, how we're called to, like Carrie was saying, not just hoard all of the goodness of God for ourselves and sit on it, but to receive it and then funnel it out into the rest of the world, be carriers of it into the rest of the world. There are different ways that we can look at the church. It's like the, the, there are different ways we can look at the, like, what the model of the church could be. And for our purposes, we'll use a, a, a nautical theme this morning, okay? Some people look at the church as a cruise ship. And it's like you, you come aboard following Jesus and you become a part of, let's just say CLF. You become a part of CLF and then it's like, I have boarded the cruise ship and it's like, well, what time are the meals served and what will be on the menu for me today and what are the activities that you have for me and what are the things that you have offered and when do we get off the boat and go take the tours of the islands and you know, like it, it's all about like what, how am I going to receive but it, it stops there with the receiving and again, we receive good things from God. Like, I, thank God that we find forgiveness through Jesus Christ. Thank God that we find healing and wholeness and deliverance through Jesus Christ. What a blessing and what a gift. But if we think that it's supposed to stop there, and it's just, I've tasted and I've seen that he's good, but then it doesn't go any further than that, we are missing the heartbeat of God. We're missing the heartbeat of God. And so the church is not meant to be a cruise ship. Another way to look at the, the church is to see it as a battleship. It's like, listen, this, this ship... CLF, like we are going someplace. There is a mission that we are on. We are moving in a specific direction. We have tasks to accomplish. Uh, we, have, we, have, we have a mission that has been given to us, but everything about a battleship is, it's like it's the battleship itself is carrying out the mission. And so like if you look at CLF, like the church, you think about CLF, it would be like, well, CLF, the organization, the 501c3 nonprofit entity that is CLF, like that's, CLF has a footprint in the community. And CLF, the church, like the, the, the organization, the building, we, we have a footprint in the community, we have a mission in the community, and that misses the point too. And what we actually feel that we're called to be as the people of God, what CLF is meant to be, is not a cruise ship and it's not a battleship, but we are called to be an aircraft carrier. Now, there's gonna be some images of an aircraft carrier scrolling behind me. If you think about an aircraft carrier, they, they're monstrous ships, and the whole purpose of them is they are moving on mission, but they don't accomplish the mission by the ship itself accomplishing the mission. They accomplish the mission by launching and sending out the dozens of jets and helicopters and other things that are on that ship. And so there's this constant sending and launching to accomplish the mission. And then those that have been sent out are coming back to that ship and they're being refueled and they're being re-equipped and then they're being sent back out. This, this is an image of what we're called to be as the church. This is what we believe God is calling CLF to be as a church, that we would launch and send it. It's not about, it's not about the entity of Christian Life Fellowship, it's about you. 
It's about all of us being sent out into our neighborhoods and into our workplaces and into our families, into the places that God is calling us to and we are being sent. We don't just believe that it's a cruise ship. We believe that we are all individually sent with our unique personalities and our giftings, with our spheres of influence and our spheres of responsibility in our lives that God is sending us out to accomplish his mission in the world around us. And again, it's not an a la carte item. We don't get to pick or choose whether or not this is something that we're going to do. If you're a follower of Jesus, this is, this is our calling. This is our responsibility, all of us, as the people of God. And we can tend to look at it, like Carrie said, like it's, well, it's the special elite people that go out and do this. But the bottom line is, we are all called to step out faithfully in our lives. What, it's going to look different in each of our lives, but we're all called to step out faithfully and to live that way. And so I want to uh, uh, show a a video of a story of somebody within our church family. Um, somebody who made themselves available. Lord, how do you want to use me in my life, in my circles of influence, in my circles of responsibility? Um, how do you want to use me? I'm available however you want. I want you to take a listen. Um, turn your eyes to the screen and listen to this story. My name is Karen Gass. I'm married to Don. And I've been part of CLF for probably 29 years. I love the scripture. I absolutely believe it. Just from reading scripture, it talks about discipling, and I thought, so how does that work? How, how can I do that? Um, Lord, bring me somebody to disciple. And if you care, God will give you those opportunities. If you care and you ask God to bring those opportunities. And when we get into real estate, we get all these people around here and many women for that matter. When we started doing women's nights and you had a lot of women coming I thought, boy, I'd like to ask Barb to at least come to one of those. I think she'd like it. Hi, my name is Barbara Stanis, and um, I've been with CLF about six years. And my introduction to CLF was through Karen and Don Gass. She did invite me to one of the ladies. It was a weekend, and um, she said, you can come. She goes, I'll, I'll pay for you to come. and." Um, after that, it was just like well, history. I, I enjoyed myself. I had the best weekend ever. Um, so I just asked her one time, so are you, do you have a small group that you go to? And she said, no, I'm just not sure what to do. So I just said, well, I'd be glad to have a Bible study with you. And as soon as I said it, I thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> but she, she said yes right away. So then when Karen said it, I was like, yes, I, I would love to do that. And um, so then when we started our little group, it was, it was just amazing. I learned so much. And we'd start reading, and I well, Karen, I got this underline. I don't know what this means. Coming from being Catholic, I... I figured that I was safe. Because I was baptized and I went to Catholic school and, and so maybe that wasn't saving enough. I needed to be saved. So, but I wasn't sure what that meant or how that was, I knew I needed it. God said, you needed to be saved. <laughs> but I wasn't sure where to go with that. So then I had asked Karen um, because I wanted to be saved. I wanted, I wanted that. Um, I just wasn't sure how to go about getting it. The first time we were together, she asked, so how do I get saved? Now, who told her to say that? That just flew me out of the water. But God had given me this um, understanding even before we came together that I need to get ready for this. 
you know, through prayer and understanding and um, talking to God and giving my life to God, I've been saved. So it makes me tear up because you can't feel my joy in my heart, but it is so overwhelming. And I tell people that I, and they don't, they don't get it, but I'm like, it just engulfs me. I think one of the greatest times that I had is when I got baptized because that completed it. And they were actually, my kids, my family were actually angry with me because I didn't invite them. And I thought, well, I, I said, I didn't think you would. There's like, mom, you should have told my daughter lives in Iowa. She was out of the home for that. I was like, well, I didn't think it mattered to them. So I was doing stuff and God was pushing me to do stuff. And I didn't realize that I had impacted them with the things that I was doing. My story has just been, God has played an amazing role in my life and I never knew it could be this fantastic. If you're not living in, in, in God's word, you're missing out big time. I, what an awesome, what an awesome story. I, I love it. it. Oh, <laughs> I was That's like, not who, a I was like who's yelling at me? What, what's it's happening Eric. right now? It's, it's Eric's just, yelling. It's just Eric, whatever. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'm like, what's wrong with my mic? Why isn't it on? Um, I love that story because there's so many elements. I love, I love Karen's, there's a, there was a desire there where she's going like, Lord, I think you want me to do this. And if you want me to do this, then I'm available. And she's actually praying and making herself available. There's, there's, you know, this keeping her eyes peeled for where the Lord might be at work and who he's placing in front of her. And there's a willingness to walk through the doors that are being opened up. There's, a, you know, an emphasis on God's word, that God's word is where these conversations were happening. Um, you, have, you have all of this where God's doing the heavy lifting through his word and all of this. And there are disciples that are being made. And so what a, if, you know, I didn't ask Karen's in this service right now. I didn't, I didn't ask her this before, but I'm, I'm assuming Karen wouldn't refer to herself as a raging extrovert, somebody who's just looking for all kinds of people. She just wants to talk all the time, and she's just, in, that's her husband. <laughs> that's more, <laughs> that's more, that's more like that. But that's, that's, Karen is less that, okay? So this isn't even like a, well, it's her personality to be out there on the streets looking for those opportunities to be talking to people, but she understands that this is what we're called to be as followers of Jesus, and so she's stepping into the opportunity opportunity um, as it presents itself. So our mission as a church is to be a movement of disciple makers. Mm -hmm. We are a movement of disciple makers. So uh, just like Jeff referenced, that means that not CLF the whole, but you, if you call yourself a follower of Jesus, mm -hmm. you follow him to be a disciple who makes a disciple who makes a disciple until kingdom come, that we would be a movement of disciple makers living on mission there's a quote by Henry Blackaby that says, watch to see where God is working and join him. Mm -hmm. I love that. Watch to see. We don't have to like fabricate it yep. or pull something up from scratch or push or strive. We just go watch what, what God's doing and just join him in mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. I, so let, let, we want to give you a little bit of vision for where we're going as a church family, okay? Um, because we believe that the Lord is wanting stories like, like Karen and Barb's to become the norm. When this is, it is happening. I mean, like we, we, we speak, if you come around here, you hear us talk the scent language all the time where we're talking about, we don't, we're not just receivers and partakers of the good news of Jesus. We are that first, but, but it doesn't stay there. It moves out. But what ends up happening is for a lot of us, we're, it, it's like we're all moving moving individually. And so we're all out, you're individually in your neighborhoods and individually in your workplaces, individually in your families, seeking to live on mission, which is a beautiful thing. But we believe that the Lord is calling us um, to, to, to do this more as Jesus did it. When Jesus sent his disciples out, he didn't send them out alone. He sent them out in community. He sent them out in groups two by two, and they would live on mission together, and then they would come back, and they would debrief, and they would be encouraged, and they would be equipped in those different kinds of ways, and so um, we believe that the Lord is calling us as a church family not just to be sent, but to be sent as a community that we would learn to walk in that way. So in the next couple of weeks, a handful of months, we are launching what we're calling missional communities, 
And so this is a vehicle that we're using to live on mission together. And our definition for missional community is a team of disciple makers who are intentionally living on mission together, focused on a specific pocket of people. And we're going to unpack what that means. Well, first of all, that kind of the, a team of disciple makers, again, that's not somebody else that's following Jesus. That's you. You are a disciple maker. You are called to be a disciple maker. And so what missional communities will be, it will be teams of people who are going, yep, I may have never done that before. I may be terrified on what that means to make a disciple, but I understand that I am commissioned by Jesus himself to carry the good news that he brought. And so I'm, I'm on board and I can be a part of a team of other disciple makers. And we say a specific pocket of people is who you're focused on. So think about where you live, where you work, uh, your, your different interests, things that you do. You're just your everyday life. And go, what do you have a heart for? In those spaces, who do you have a heart for? Who are those people who go, man, I, I have a heart for my neighborhood. Or, uh, or there's some people that, that I work out with at the gym, and, and man, I have a heart for some of those people. It could be a school district that you're like, oh, I have really have a heart for the other parents or teachers that are part of this school district. And so that pocket of people would be specifically focused where you're already going. And you would look at who are the other believers that are there. You look at those different spaces and go, you know what, actually I have, there are a few Christians that are, that are at this school district. What it, would it look like if you got together and you prayed for that school district? Where you go, okay, we're just going to pray for these specific teachers. We're going to pray for these students. We're going to pray that God would open up opportunities for us to, to reach people with the gospel. Yeah, I, so th- there's, there's a whole lot to this, and we're going to keep unpacking this next week. We're going to unpack it some more. Um, coming up, there's some practical steps for you to take. But in the, the first thing for us to understand, we'll give you just a couple of practical steps in just a moment. The first thing that we have to understand is that for us to engage in this way within community, it's going to require a paradigm shift for, for all of us. Yeah, um, so it starts with that kingdom mindset. It mm-hmm. starts with that all in, right? So if we don't see our spiritual lives is something separate. It means that everything that we're doing, everything that we're engaged with, all the places that we're going, all the, you know, our, our, our whole lives are wrapped up with this mindset and this filter of, okay, God, what are you doing here? Like, it's that kingdom mindset. And so it takes that kingdom mindset first, that we're all in for the kingdom of God. And then it takes intentionality. So that's intentionality in prayer. Start praying for the lost, praying for people who don't know Jesus. It takes an intentionality in priorities. You may have to reorient your priorities. It takes intentionality of of actually looking for who can I do this in community with where it's not isolated on my own, but I'm actually, we're holding each other accountable. We're, we're, We're sharing stories with each other. We're encouraging each other and going, oh man, I just had this awesome conversation with this person. Like, let's pray for them. Pray that God would continue to work in their lives. And so it takes that intentionality to, to move forward in this. So basically what we're believing is going to happen, what we're working towards, is that our, our desire is as the Lord's stirring our hearts as a church family, as a movement, um, and the Lord's stirring our hearts for different people in your spheres uh, of influence and your spheres of responsibility, that you will, that the Lord is going to help put together teams of people that have similar burdens for similar pockets of people, and that we'll be able to form teams as a result of that, and that will be what missional communities are, where you endeavor to live on mission to the same pocket of people, and you're, li- you're endeavoring to do that together within a community, and so there's a couple steps for, um, for us to take. If you're, because again, there's a whole lot more that's going to go into this, um, so if you are interested in this, if there's something in you that's stirring, you're, you're kind of sitting up straight right now going like, I, something in me, like I, I want to be a part of this. I, I'm sensing the Lord's been calling me to something and I don't exactly know what it's going to look like, but I sense the Lord calling me to more and we've been having conversations with people along those lines recently. Then your first step is going to be next week. So we're going to keep talking about this next week, but next week on Sunday, September 29th at 6 p.m., we're going to have an interest meeting. And so if you are interested, it doesn't mean you're signing up. It doesn't mean like there's going to be no blood oath that's going to be taken that night. If you're just going like, look, I something's stirring in me and I want more information. I would love to know what this is going to look like because we're going to train you. We're going to equip you. We're going to give you the tools that you need to step out in this way. Um, And so if you want more information on what that's going to look like, then come out next Sunday, September 29th uh, at 6 p.m. I think the slide says 6 to 8 
a.m. It's not going to be two hours. It's going to be just over an hour that we'll meet together, um, and you'll be able to ask any questions that you have there. We gave this morning a lot of the why mm-hmm. and a lot of the, yeah. the what we're doing, but the how, and, and we're going to equip you. So yeah. uh, basically, in October, November, we're going to have eight weeks of, of training and that, uh, if you're already like, okay, sign me up, you know, whatever, go to the interest meeting. But to give you a heads up, we're going to have eight weeks on Monday nights where we're going to gather together and we're going um, to eat together. We're going to uh, pray together. It's going to be immersion. It's not just going to be someone talking to you, at you. We're going to actually be equipped and then practice what we've been talking about. And so we'll give tools. We'll share stories. Uh, when this stuff starts happening, when we start being more intentional about it, we're going to see God do something at a rate that we weren't even expecting. He's going to open up our eyes to things and opportunities that uh, they're like, oh, wow. Like, I actually started praying in this direction. Look what God's doing. God is stirring something up. Don't be the person <laughs> who is like, nah, God, I, God can't do that. Don't forfeit this season where you're like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, like Elisha said of going, oh, yeah, God's going to do it. <laughs> He's going to do that work. And so we're asking, man, let's be all in as a church. What would it look like if we were to mobilize? There's, if we were to mobilize all of us together in community, to, family trees would be changed. Lives would be transformed. Our community would be completely transformed. You multiply what happened in Karen and Barb's story time and time and time again, that could change our entire community. And God can do it. Why not here? Why not us? Absolutely. So uh, here's, so like we said, your, your next step is next Sunday night at 6 p.m. Um, and we'll have a, we'll have any interest that you have, we'll answer the questions um, to the best of our ability. It'll be great. You'll get more details. So this morning, what I want us to do, we're going to close in prayer. So I'm going to ask you to stand, uh, stand up this morning. And um, your assignment, your first assignment is to start praying. It's to start asking the Lord to, maybe you're already feeling it, ask the Lord to stir that up even more, to give you more of a burden, to give you, like Carrie said earlier in the message, that he would give you his eyes to see and he would give you his ears to hear, that you would see the world around you the way that he sees the world around you, that you would um, desire to be used by him in whatever way he wants to use you and let him stir up the faith that it takes to step out in obedience and whatever it is um, that the Lord is calling you to. And so we're gonna, we're gonna pray along those lines to close. So if you're comfortable, if you wanna close your eyes, if you're good with it, hold your hands, palms up. Again, we just, that's a posture for us saying, God, we're, we come empty-handed before you. Um, we don't hold anything back from you. You have access to every part of our life and, 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 and we'll receive from you whatever it is that you're wanting to give to us. And so let's pray. God, we pray right now that you would breathe on us with your breath, oh God. That you would fill us with life that comes from you. God, that you would, as you breathe your breath into us and you give us your life, that we would love the world around us the way that you love, that we would, that we would um, act out and move in the same ways that you do, God. And so we just pray that you would give us your mindset, that you would give us your heart, that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would send us out into our lives in this week, cultivate in us and stir up in us not just an openness to being used by you, but a desire and a longing to be used by you. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.